This week, I was lucky enough to preview a new exhibition at the Tate Britain called Women in Revolt, Art and Activism in the UK, 1970-1990. It's billed as something of a landmark exhibition exploring how interconnected networks of women use radical ideas and rebellious methods to make an invaluable contribution to British culture. We were treated to an introduction by the curator herself, Lindsay Young. There's two reasons I wanted to make the show. The first is because, well, there's many, but the first is because I wasn't taught this art history. So I went to, did, went to the University of Glasgow and the University of Manchester, graduated last in 2007, and I wasn't taught about these women. And I started to think about when I got this job, I've been here eight years, British curator, contemporary British art. I don't know about it. I don't know about these women. So it kind of felt like a duty to find out. And the other reason is it's a celebration for my mother, who died uh, three years ago. And I wanted to make the show for her because she was a working class woman, super left wing, a nurse, hilarious, lived with a disability, died too young because I'd say men, but that's just me. But, uh, uh, you know, lived with a lot of inequality. And I wanted to show that the women of her generation, even if they look... uh, normal are generally fabulous and have some dark secret somewhere, some creative endeavour. Be that crochet, be that being in a bank with fist fuck, whatever it is, there's you know they've got it. So there are over a hundred artists in the show. Um, there are about 112, 14 individual artists and if you count collectives there are almost 140. And that's a lot. Um, but when I was talking to Linda about it a few months ago, she said, out of scarcity comes excess, Lindsay. Like, just go for it, just do it. And I've kind of stuck to that, because I think if you're given this space, just fill it. Like, you don't know when you're going to get it again. So I might have made the wrong decision, but you can, you know, you can work that out yourself. I'd also say it's not in any way a definitive history of the time. There are, I'd say, three exhibitions you could make with the same title, with totally different artists. But I've chosen to look at the things that I'm interested in. So that is socialist politics, Marxist politics, anti-capitalism, independent music, the, the people who are marginalised. Like those are the ones who I wanted to bring forward in this exhibition. Also, really importantly, it's about constellations, not stars. I really am bored of this like art historical, patriarchal privileging of people over others and I think by showing a constellation of people you can kind of pick the things you like, you can make your own analysis and find your own journey through the exhibition. Um, There's a huge range of media across the show so there's, um, I think there was a worry internally that it would be quite boring and quite, not boring, that's the thing, no one said that, quite archival, quite heavy. Uh, but actually there is painting, there is sculpture, there is moving image, that sound is a woman giving birth. Um, there is, yeah, there's this whole host of different kind of practices to look at. And what else is important? Yeah, a lot of it comes from cupboards. So many of these women were able to sustain practice, like, to sustain their archives or look after their artwork because of finance, because of precarity of housing. And so a huge amount of conservation work has been done to kind of bring it back, which is very really exciting. Um, also, all of the gaze is a, a woman's gaze. So there are no, all the documentary photography, all the things that have been made, have been made by women. So, uh, yeah, that's quite unusual, I think. We work really hard to make sure that the documentary photography in the catalogue as well is all taken by a woman. Um, outside of the house, we've got a flag on the roof by Rose Finn Kelsey, which is a work she in, in, initially made for Battersea Power Station in the 70s. We have Bobby Baker's house outside, which I'm sure you're going to see. This amazing uh, installation. We've made a podcast. Uh, we've made a record. Thank you, Julie and her team. Um, and we're really just trying to take up big, right? Take up as much space as we possibly can. Um, and and share lots of different points of view because a lot of the women in this show completely disagree with each other on really fundamental things but that doesn't matter because they're still able and happy to share space and to hold those discussions so I think that's a really uh, important part of the show Um, do you want me to talk about each room or is that a lot of information? (laughs) very quickly so 
Notice the room titles. I'm very proud of the room titles. So this room is called uh, Rising with Fury, and it's about the sort of following the timeline about the very early 1970s through to the mid 70s. So thinking about early conferences, early collective actions, performance artists who were just kind of coming up. Exhibitions that were shut down by the police because men saw the police men thought they were so controversial because they had drawings of boobs and photographs of vulvas, outrageous. Um, work about pay, um, and then the second room, I'm really quick now, the second room is called <laughs> The Marxist Wife Still Does the Housework, which is a kind of aping of a title by Alexis Hunter. And it's about the maternal experience and the domestic experience, but very much seeing it as something you can rip up and pull apart and put back together again. So we have Linda in that room, we have Gina Birch from the Raincoats, screaming this wonderful work she made in 1977, um, we have Gordon Giving Birth. And we have a two meter high labia made out of carpet. So there is something for everyone. Um, the third room is called Our Bondage Up Years, of course, out of respect for Paul Styrene, uh, Marianne Elliott Said. And we have her work in the show. So we have one uh, surviving artwork by Paul Styrene that's there. We also have work by the New Naturists, by Jill Westwood, who's in a band called Fistfuck, who her practice was being a dominatrix. So there's these extraordinary photos of her uh, at work. Cozy Fan Tutti across two rooms, uh, the kind of punk bondage room, and the next one about internal kind of bodily experience. We have Winter. We have Polly Desai, who was one of the youngest artists on the show, who's kind of really brilliant young, well, she's in her late 50s now, but uh, lesbian punk uh, women of colour working at that time. Who else? You've seen. There's loads of women here. Um, then we go to a room about Green Common. So thinking about that site as a space for women coming together for their protests, for them also thinking about how to live in non-heteronormative kind of nuclear ways. Like a lot of women I've spoken to became came out after going to Greenham or moved into kind of different kinds of ways of living after sharing that camp together. We have banners by an artist called Thalia Campbell, whose granny was a suffragette and she learned to make banners with her and then continued to make them for her whole career. Um, and amazing uh, laminated poster exhibition, which was sent out to community centres all over the country, which is brought back together here. Then there's a room called Black Women Time Now, which is two very big room, or a very big room split into two, and it really focuses on the early to mid 80s and thinking about the changing face of British culture, and particularly the visibility of black artists of colour, black feminist artists of colour. So the first room looks at the context, context of things like rebellions, uprisings, the Scarman Report, police brutality, sus laws, stop and search laws, and how women uh, pushed against that. And the second half looks at women of colour's creativity, um, connectivity, passion, beauty, and tries to expand that out. So we have uh, work by Nina Edge, which is on the cover of a very important book called Passion by Lord Salter. And the work by Nina is thought lost, but we have brought it back together for this exhibition, which is very exciting. Um, and we have work by uh, Rita Keegan. So Rita Keegan is amazing artist of colour, and she uses her family history to kind of reinsert the, the joy of her body, her community into the space. And in our podcast, there's this really beautiful quote where she says, um, the reason that I put my face in my work again and again is because when little black girls come to the gallery, I want them to see themselves here. And so that's very much the kind of spirit of that room. The final room is called No Such Thing as Society. Of course, after Thatcher's uh, famous quote, um, famous quote where she's celebrating, you know, capitalism and individualism and all that brilliant stuff that served us really well decades and the room really focuses on um, lesbian reaction to section 28 and the student AIDS epidemic so very much thinking about how lesbians fought for visibility with extraordinary humour in the face of devastation of their communities um, and the end end on a room that celebrates the single mother uh, who of course struggled all the time particularly in the late 80s and also 
looks at the effect that the emerging commercial market would have on artists. So a lot of the women I spoke to, which is most of them, said that the emergence of uh, the YBA movement in the late 80s, through no fault of the artists, really had an effect on the practice because attention went over there and not to them. What's interesting about that is that Saatchi and Saatchi made the advert labour isn't working that scholars have said got Thatcher in, pushed her over the line, and they are then the first people buying the trading network. So there's this really interesting relationship between the capitalism and commerce and this radical practice. Love women! My colleague Billy Reeves caught up with Lindsay for some further questions. So my name is Lindsay Young and I'm curator of British Contemporary Art at Tate. There's a thin line, isn't there, between contemporary art and social history, this exhibition. How have you managed to unblur those lines? I'm not sure I have. And I think they're, you know, I'm kind of equally passionate about both. And I think it's hard to understand art without its context. And it's really important to understand your history. I think especially for feminists or activists of any kind to know the work that's gone before so that you can build on it rather than reinventing the wheel. Explain to us what we can see in this particular room and what the exhibition is all about. So this is the first exhibition, it's called Rising with Fury, and it's about the very early moments of the women's liberation movement in the UK. So you can see what I hope is a very elegant room uh, with wooden partitions that we created an exhibition space that harks back to the 1970s, that, or spaces like the ICA. Yeah. Um, and you can see a huge amount of work, photographs of conferences, paintings of women, uh, photographs of performance, and behind me a series of postal artworks, which were small objects that women made at the kitchen table and then posted to each other. Much of this action, if we're talking certainly the Dunwich strike and women's liberation, happened in London. What's what's here that is specifically about London? Yes, I mean I tried, I'm Scottish, uh, yeah. so I tried to make it as broad across the country as I could, yeah. but there is a reason people come to London, right? There's a reason that weirdos escape to London when they're 17, like I tried to. Um, and uh, specific to London, there's. A, I'm trying to think. Well, there's the, well, there's the punk scene, I guess, isn't Gina Birch? And, well, punk was yeah. big in Leeds as well. Oh, right, so there course, was a lot yeah. going on with Leeds, uh, with Chyla Berman mm-hmm. and Shutupa Biswas was engaged with the punk scene. But you're right, I think and something. Polystyrene, yeah, polystyrene or the work of the neo naturists who are going to the fridge in Brixen uh, and going to the Blitz, yeah, course, those yeah. kind of things, really important. Yeah. Also, the, uh, the exhibitions you will see in. Sorry, the, the Hackney Flashers work in room two. Okay. It's a laminated exhibition and it charts uh, or looks at uh, childcare and it's specific to London. And in fact, you can still identify streets in London on it. So, yeah, it's very local. Finally, from me, how do you gauge success as a curator at Tate Britain? Is it bums on seats? Is it legs through doors? Is it the subcultural capital of it all? Is it press and radio? How do you gauge whether or not this has been a success or not? That's such a good question. For me, success is if the artists are happy. Um, I'm responsible to them, of course, to the institution and to the public, but if the artists go away happy, then we've done a good job. Has anything in here got a financial value? Everything has a financial value, but I think it's interesting not to think about that so much and actually think about what our art world would look like if we cared about that a bit less. Also visiting the preview was our dear friend Helen McCookery Book, who was visiting on behalf of Radio 4. So Billy took the opportunity to ask her thoughts on the exhibition too. Because what I'm interested in is why you're here. So from a radio point of view, formal radio, can you say your name and your job title? Which name? Which name do you use when you're broadcasting on the BBC, Helen? Well, Samira just called me McCookery Book, so I suppose I am that, yeah. <laughs> just so, that, then? Yeah. So can you see your name and your role? Well, I'm Helen McCookery Book, and today's role <laughs> is uh, I'm reporting for Samira Ahmed for Radio 4's Front Row. What I'm interested in this context of this law is, is Front Row's target audience, right? Who would you say listens to Radio 4's Front Row? And secondly, why would they be interested in this? Well, me, when there are things on Front Row that interest me, because Samira's some... Um, She's a real um, cultural force. I was thinking how much she must have inside her head 
because if you listen to her programme, she's uh, very knowledgeable about every every person that she it's, interviews. It's about the arts and theatre in general. It's about the arts yeah. and music. Um, I mean, last week she did a feature on Two Tone. Okay. Um, uh, she interviewed the author Daniel Rachel, who was actually too young to be around at that period, but um, he's really good at listening to people and picking up what makes a movement happen and how it how the different aspects of a movement intersect to create something that's really powerful so she interviewed him and also Pauline Black who is in a band called The Selector and she's a very unusual um, when, whenever I've met Pauline um, she's actually a real introvert doing an extrovert well, yeah, you know as a perform she's yeah. really extrovert um, and in a very similar way to Rhoda Dakar, who was also part of that Body movement. Snatchers, yeah. yeah, she's really contrarian. So if you ask a question, you don't know what the you can't expect, yeah. you can't anticipate what. So, the that's, so that's to interesting. Be. So when you're talking about heritage stuff, heritage art, heritage music, our generation has kind of moved into Radio 4's target audience age-wise. Would you say? Because if you're talking well, two tone and yeah, you're talking some, the, po- the over fifties, yeah, I think some have. But you've also got to remember that there's this kind of borderline, um, very right wing kind of cohort of people of our that generation radio, that, yeah. who who also have to be catered for by the media. And I think it's quite interesting because um, shows like Front Row resist that. Um, through wearing the gloves of art and music and theatre, ah, yeah. which is, you know, it's um, it's a very kind of... Uh, is it the establishment allowing a little bit of Marxism? I think it's more than that. It's, it's, um, it's a respect for a very knowledgeable presenter who's... Okay. Um, who does a lot of research and who understands the fact that they are actually resisting by doing what they're doing. Yeah. And I mean, some resistance is very loud, and this, the resistance yeah. in this exhibition is very loud, but some resistance is very quiet, and it, it opens the door quietly and sneaks in and gets a, yeah. a place at the table. And that, that's equally as important, because um, my experience of being an artist and musician is that if you shout, sometimes people just put their hands over, your, over their ears. Yeah. And yeah, it's, so, hect- it's yeah. hectoring and preaching to the yeah. crowd we were talking about. And what what I well. particularly like about this exhibition is the, well, first of all, it's two things in one. It's the amount of accessible media that people used. So it's paper, it's things that in your kitchen you could reach for, or at work you could reach for, you could get to the photocopier, or you could reach across the kitchen and get a piece of paper and, and do something. And it's, you know, small posters, zines, badges those kind of things where people are thinking their art straight onto the paper yeah. which is really spontaneous and it's unmediated yeah. they didn't have to um, get sponsorship from anybody to do it they stole the photocopier paper I guess a lot of it that. originally wasn't art it's, it becomes no, it art because it's in an art gallery yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean the reason <laughs> of having three identities is because People really attack you if they think you're overstepping your mark, especially as a woman. Yeah. And um, I spoke to Vic Reeves about exactly this recently. You're allowed to have yeah. more than one idea. Yeah. So you, ha- so you know, my way of dealing that is with that is to divide my output into different areas. But you never know who's paying attention to what you do. Yeah. And I think, like a lot of the artists here, everything comes out spontaneously, and then you decide which what's going to be the vehicle for that, you know? I, I wonder if the answer to that question is it's because it's at the Tate Britain. I mean, this really yeah. legitimises it, doesn't it? If this was in, you know, the Cube in Hackney or whatever it's called, then it would be dismissed perhaps as a little bit crank. But the well, fact that it's in here legitimises it, would you say? I think it does, but I think the seeds of this were... I mean, I absolutely loved Hugh Locke's exhibition here, um, the carnival um, parade yeah. that he did. Um, I just kept coming back and looking that at it. That was the one that was in the, in the, the main in, hall. In yeah. the main hall, and I think, um, well, I think it's absolutely essential to recognise the power. And, and what, what's good about this exhibition is collecting together a load of um, women activists who didn't, might not have realised the power of who they were until this actually happened. You know, I'm going round and I'm seeing. I think, I used to work with her and yeah. oh I know her and yeah. you know it's, it's really funny because 
um, the tendency with political activism is to put it into silos yeah. and to say, oh, well, you know, that happened, and it and it's, makes it weak. Yeah. So if you join together all of the bits of the jigsaw in an exhibition like this, you can see there's a massive amount of strength. And yeah. um, I, I've almost cried at several points, yeah. you know, just realising how strong some of the and also artists the, And also the are. grief that they went through at Greenham and Graham yeah. McNorris. Well, yeah. Does it make a difference? Oh, yeah. Political activism. Massively. And I mean, I mean I've mean, i got two daughters who are both quite active. They, you know, they support various different political causes and they're both artists in different ways. And um, it's also in the way they are. Like, um, one of them works in the fashion industry and has a lot of um, trans friends and a lot of queer friends. And um, But she doesn't even notice, if that's, you see what that's I mean. A, that, that, I mean and that's it's that a, kind of thing of not saying, look at this extraordinary thing I'm yeah. doing by performing the way that... And this is what the spontaneity of this... It's the power of this. It's that the, there are very few examples of anybody performing their art there are examples of people realizing they're having to perform their gender but that's really different it's like people absolutely opening their souls yeah. bearing their souls and creating words and film and and art but that's i mean but that's that's personal activism yeah. to change your i mean i'm talking about group activism because there has to be a certain amount of violence and fear from the authorities to change things. I mean, you've seen a little bit of that here. Well, yes, I think I noticed the um, lesbians um, in support of um, the minors. Yeah. And that's where you really get a lot of... I mean, that's why um, Rock Against Racism is so powerful. Yeah. And I mean, I was actually directly, you know, performing yeah. at that time. Yeah. And um, you'd, so you would know that within the Rastafarian culture, for instance, there were things that that didn't make you feel particularly comfortable as a white woman. Yeah. But you also understood that resisting um, the things that were oppressing you collectively was more important than those divisions that you might have felt that were cultural divisions. So being from an outsider culture, if you collected together with other people from an outsider culture and didn't... Um, common enemy yeah a, a common enemy but through creativity yeah the music so is has been important in this exhibition people. as well as it yeah, yeah. why is that yeah. well because music gets under people's skin and you can hate i mean most women for instance will have at least one really really misogynist record that they really like yeah. because the music's so great yeah and this is, it does make you question your own, how messages are delivered to you. How messages are delivered to you. And how they're delivered to you effectively yeah. and how they can get under your skin through, you know, the power of art, music and theatre and writing and all of poetry, all of these things. And you ha it teaches you as a kind of um, observer or a participant in culture to be like a tide coming and going. So you'll flow into something and you'll sort of say, yeah, but that's not right, that doesn't feel right. And you flow back and you think about it. So the next time you flow forward, you're thinking, yeah, but I've processed that and I it's think this, like, yeah. you know. Yeah. And you understand how powerful you are. As, I mean, it's really powerful to be somebody who comes to something like this. There's yeah. somebody clicking and how many people are coming? Shall we yeah, do no, this again? Exactly, yeah, exactly, it's really yeah. important to be visible and to go and make your presence felt in something like this and to sort of process what you see, whether or not you like it. It's really important to, to be a, a participant in culture, especially when it's a culture that involves so much political thought. Yeah. A massive, you know, it sounds really patronising to sort of say how, how astonishing the amount of thought yeah. and processing of... Um, politics and culture and and gender and yeah, and, you different, know, and different mediums and different me yeah, yeah. Uh, expertise in different media yeah, and yeah. experimenting finding new ways of doing things and and funny funniness yeah. horrific funniness i mean there's that that artwork there of the guy 
the, the white guy with the dog that's his penis. I mean, that's one of the best pieces of artwork. And, you know, I see the things, I think, I wish I'd thought of that. Yeah. And I know I'm going to go away and I'm going to think, right, 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 I've got to, yeah. you know, because you see something as stimulating as this and you just think, I've got to... I've got to carry on doing stuff and I've got to rethink this and rethink that. And Loud Women! Accompanying the exhibition is a compilation record um, out now on neon yellow vinyl. Um, and it's also out on the, the streaming services. Um, it's a release that it says here, it aims to compile tracks from some of the most trailblazing and often unsung women working in UK music between 77 and 85. What a period. Um, it's called Women in Revolt. And um, and we're going to be reviewing it, I think, on the site um, in more detail soon. So look out for that. Um, it's it's quite a record featuring um, several of the artists who are involved in the exhibition. Um, Cozy Fanny Tootie, Linda Sterling, uh, Gina Birch, of course, from The Raincoats, and Polly Styrene from X-Ray Specs. It's also got a, a really cool playlist to accompany the exhibition, um, kind of bringing it up to date with um, lots of bands that, that we're more, more familiar with at, at Loud Women, um, bands like Big Joni and Hot Wax. Um, so kind of bringing, bringing the musical struggle up to date. Um, the exhibition is on at the Tate Britain um, now until the 7th of April, so plenty of time to, to get up there. Um, and I think I'm going to have to go up there at least one more time again because um, there was so much there, I, I didn't get to, to see any half of it. Loud Women! I'm Cassie Fox, this is Loud Women, thanks for listening. Loud Women!